Good morning, my name is Saroja Coelho. I'm a journalist focused on human rights and it's wonderful to see all these people here today. Um, this discussion, this is a spotlight session. Actually, before we do that, it's a little bit of housekeeping. Um, could we have a show of hands for anyone who needs French translation? Est-ce que vous avez besoin de traduction française? Levez la main, s'il vous plaît. No. Okay, does anybody need Arabic translation from the, from the translators? Does anyone need Arabic? If you could raise your hand if you need Arabic translation. Okay, at the moment then we don't. We're going to do the session in English. We do have translators. We just weren't sure um, which language we would be offering on which channels. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, no, we only have, unfortunately, we only have French, French and Arabic. I'm sure there's many languages in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, this session will be um, focusing, it's a discussion about initiatives with, I'm sorry, we've got a bit of noise outside, but we're going to do our best to deal with it. Um, we'll be looking at initiatives with faith and community leaders who support efforts to end FGM and child marriage. Uh, we have a panel of five speakers. Everybody's going to get about five minutes to speak. We'll be looking at lessons learned from interfaith dialogues, and we'll also be examining ways to build ties with non-faith community, uh, non-faith groups. So that includes educators, health workers, uh, people in the legal sector, and even going beyond that, looking for private sector partners. We'd really like to um, also think about ways to keep momentum going. So when projects end, how do we keep the lessons learned? What do we do with that in, in the future? So we're going to try and cover a lot. Um, I'm going to be a treacherous guardian of time. I'm going to be ruthless, and I'm sorry for that, but it's a great way for us to make sure that everybody gets a chance to say what they need to. I really encourage you to use the time in the corridors, in all of these different places where you're going to be standing together, turn to your neighbor, talk to them about what you're here to learn and what you'd like to know about with them, because we really want to encourage you to keep talking. We just can't do it all in this room, unfortunately, in the short hour that we have. Um, I am going to now turn to our first speaker. Um, Rebecca Mashunge is, excuse me, sorry, move, move my papers around. Um, she's a regional program officer. She focuses on gender and sexual reproductive, reproductive health rights and HIV for Southern Arica region at HIVOS. She's worked in Malawi for the last nine months on the child marriage program, but has been focusing on that issue since 2011. She's a qualified nurse and uh, holds an MSc in public health as well as an MBA. Thank you. Thank you very much and good morning everybody. Um, I hope you can all hear me clearly. I've been asked specifically to talk about um, child marriages and the experiences that we've had in terms of actually implementing. Now, my role with HIVOS has been to work within the Malawi context where we actually agreed to focus on just child marriages as a program. And we've been doing this since uh, 2011. And at the time, I think there was a report that had come out of um, uh, uh, UNFPA and ICWR uh, uh, talking about which were the hotspots countries for child marriages and at the time Malawi was actually number nine or number ten and now it's actually number nine so we felt that within our own countries where we were working this was a critical part and our starting point very much was we coined a program that we called a multi-actor initiative and the idea then was actually born out of the fact that somebody had already said in the uh, um, summit that no one person can actually do this on their own. So we coined this a multi-actor. And I must be honest, at that time in 2011, we were not actually quite sure how this was going to play out. So I went to Malawi to really do a, a scoping exercise and look at who we're working with. And naturally, the, the, the default was to go directly to civil society and worked with some of the civil society partners we'd worked with as EVOS for many, many years, dating back in the 80s. And we looked at it at, at, in a two-pronged approach, a community-based and a national-based. So we wanted to link the two. So we funded seven organizations who were working directly with communities to look at how this issue plays out at community level. And then also start looking at national level to see how the national leadership looked at this program, uh, pro on this issue. So what we actually came out with, there was a lot of lessons. We then realized after some couple of years of working specifically at community level, engaging the seven different groups or disciplines, which was health, uh, justice, social welfare, police, um, 
media, business people, and uh, who traditional leaders and, and faith leaders. We then decided that at that level, what really was needed was to upscale it to a national level. And we, call, we did a symposium, a national symposium in 2013, which called upon the national leadership of those groups because it transpired that at community level, you couldn't actually do this unless the national leadership bought into the idea. So the national symposium enabled us to engage faith groups at very senior level, traditional leaders at very senior level, because all the work that we had been doing and engaging with other partners who were doing other work indicated that from a rights-based, which is what we worked upon, uh, what was important was actually to look at the norms of the society and how society responded to which leadership. And the primary leadership they responded to was actually the faith leadership and the traditional leadership. And what was also interesting from a lessons learned point of view is that how these, all these, these are not in silos. These communities are born out of people who go to church, people who are professionals, people who are in the media, and people who are uh, believe in, the, in their tradition. So we actually thought that this would be a good way of, uh, of uh, addressing uh, the issue. So community leadership uh, involved the chiefs primarily. And what the chiefs uh, took upon to do was to start addressing using bylaws in Malawi to now punish, because what we realized was that the statutory framework was not actually addressing the issue because the statutory framework said no child would be married before they were 15. And even if they were married at 15, it was with parental consent. And that taught us two things. One, the misunderstanding of the word consent. For parents meant they were forcing the children. So we were trying to, say, all these dynamics were coming out. And then the second thing was that if the statutory laws were followed, why is it that in Malawi we've got girls who were being married at 12, at 13, and at 14? So for that reason, we actually began to realize that uh, we needed to do a lot more work at community level, and that the two had to come together. So that's the main strategy that we've had to use. And what have we seen in terms of um, progress? I'm, I'm being told one minute, so I have to rush. What have we seen in terms of progress? In terms of progress, I think we see a Malawi now that is at national level, everybody is tuned to this issue. Everybody wants to work at this issue. We've got some real commitments from both traditional leaders to work with statutory laws because the bylaws will not be binding at statutory level unless they are linked up with statutory. So we're working on that. With the faith leaders, one coin, which I must say, is that I remember one leader saying to me, Rebecca, you have to bring, you have to invite people to your symposiums. We don't, people come to us all the time, so we can be your change agent, as long as we are capacitated to do so. So that's the kind of work we're doing. Sorry, I've taken a bit more Thank you so much. Um, I'm sure everybody will have questions and ideas that they want to share. We'll have time for that at the end of the session. We're going to move to our next speaker. Shaheen Ashraf is with, she's at the end here. Hello. Uh, she's, at the, she's the national lead for FGM with the UK Women's Network. She's a trained counselor and a Muslim chaplain at the University of Birmingham. I'm doing in Birmingham on a local level. So the aim of our research, and I'm actually the lead research on, on the project that we're doing, is uh, understanding FGM locally and building on existing frameworks, and also setting out to find out what the attitudes are and who are the influential drivers of FGM within our communities. So, and what is the best impact that we will have from the work that we do? and. Uh, how we learn lessons from the work that we are tackling within Birmingham. So in Birmingham specifically, we have 29 FGM practicing communities and they're all in various, located within certain boroughs of Birmingham. And what we noticed was that uh, engagement and research tends to happen through workshops only. And we wanted to try a different approach. And one of the things we realized was quickly was that uh, another effective method is to re other than reaching out to the activists that come to the workshops, we're not reaching the hard to 
get ordinary women that are affected by FGM. So addressing the needs, uh, we had a three-pronged approach. One was um, talking to schools and uh, having existing workshops within those schools. The second is community engagement, which is really vitally important, but, but the most hardest task of all. And the third was engaging men and boys, which is even harder than engaging the community. So, and uh, I've been doing this work for over a year now, so I'm still at, at the infancy stage, but what I've discovered is quite harrowing. And also, change needs to happen because a lot of, especially within the schools, if I go over the school scenario, is um, I, we teach girls from 11 onwards because we're not allowed to teach before, um, ages before that. What we've noticed is still many girls believe that it's still a religious issue. And, uh, you know, as a case last week was uh, a girl came in, uh, saw the word FGM, put her hands in her head and cried, oh my God, I hope this is not a religious thing, even when I actually mentioned that it's actually a very traditional based thing. Within the community, I find that women have to be the voices of change. Women have to be able to understand that this is a barbaric act. And what can drive us as women is not women from those communities, but women like ourselves who are not from FGM affected communities because we can be drivers for change. Um, I've had a, a young a survivor from the age, she's now 47, and she had FGM done at, s at the age of seven three times within a three week period. Um, one where the local, um, the local cleaner from a hospital in Somaliland uh, was her FGM cutter. Um, she stole the medicines, she stole the anesthetic. She put the anesthetic inside her, but instead of cutting, she had type three done, she cut through her cartilage. So straight away she had to go to hospital. The second time after she came back out of hospital, it was re-sewn again, but then herbs were put in. The third time, the third week, she was playing with her brother and she fell out of a tree. And then she had to have it done again. This woman has spoke up at the age of 47. She has never, ever told her story to anyone. And when I heard her harrowing story, it was unbelievable. This woman also, now every time she has a relationship with her husband, ends up sitting in a bowl of cold water, and that is every week, but never spoke about it. So these are the harrowing stories, experiences we have of women who I work with in the community. And they are absolute survivors. And you know, this particular lady said, I will definitely come out and speak, but I don't think she's quite ready at the moment. Uh, she still has a lot of issues to deal with. And you have to understand some of these women came from post-conflict areas. Not only are they dealing with PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, but they are also dealing with a lot of emotional baggage that they're carrying around, which they are unable to deal with. And engaging men, uh, men and boys, now this I think falls into four types. And I had to write the types down because there's four types of different individuals that I've come across. One is the public con condemnation of religious leaders, faith leaders, leaders in general, coming out saying, I totally disagree with FGM. But on having deeper conversations with them, I've realized that actually, one minute, oh, um, actually realizing that they do disagree with type three but they believe that type one, two, and four are Sunnah. So that's the first thing I found. The second thing I found out was that several fathers who I work with are coming out and talking about FGM simply because they have young girls, one father in particular who has an 11-year-old, eight-year-old, and a four-year-old, but he gets constant calls from him, his mother-in-law from Gambia saying, my daughters are not clean, my daughters are not clean, so you have to come to Gambia. Uh, and he's tried to fight tooth and nail to not go back to Gambia, but the problem is the pressure is immense on him that the relationship between him and his wife is stirring. The third type I find is fathers who are practicing Muslims who have actually said, I do not want my daughters to go through this because if God had created women whole and God did not want women to have a part, then he would not have placed it there. So these are the men that I'm totally engaging with. and. Uh, and it has a real significance to, oh gosh, you said the end? <coughs> okay, so I just wanna say one last thing, and I don't want people to assume that 
not only is this thing happening in our communities, I mean, we've had a case where a 17-year-old has had FGM done in, a, in London in, in a private health clinic. So that's something that I want people to know and not assume that it only happens within our communities. And my lessons forward, I can't talk about because I'm out of time. We will definitely be picking up lessons learned in the discussion and please do hold on to your questions. I'm also going to give you a little bit of information just in case you're interested in more work from some of our speakers. Um, for Rebecca Mahunge, you can go to www.hivos.org, that's her organization. And for um, Shaheen Ashraf, you can go to uh, www.mwnuk.co. UK, and it is available on some of the material that some of you already have in your hands. We're moving on now to our third speaker. Dr. Madad Barungi is the president and founder of World Shine Ministries. Part of the work that he's doing is working with teachers to help identify and support girls affected by FGM. He's also, he also founded the Public Integrity Research Cons Consultancy Organization, that's a mouthful, um, and is a senior lecturer in development ethics at uh, Kiambogo University. to uh, talk to you about a collaborative project that World Shine Ministries and 28 Too Many uh, are undertaking in Uganda. World Shine Ministries is a Christian organization based in Eastern Uganda, which believes in transforming lives through education. As most of you know, that ideas have consequences. If it is a bad idea, it will have a terrible consequence. If it is a good idea, it will have a bad consequence. So our focus is on education, changing people's minds. Our programs help to prevent gender and sexual-based violence, enhance child protection, and empower girls and women to their potential. And 28 Too Many is a charity working to end female genital mutilation. It focuses on research and enabling local initiatives to end FGM in the 28 African countries where it is practiced and across the diaspora. So the project that we had, which I want to report about because we, have, uh, we are doing many things about FGM, about uh, early marriages, but I just want to focus on one. Uh, in Uganda is to incorporate FGM in child safeguarding training for teachers at the World Shine Foundation School in Uganda. We had a, 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 a workshop there and uh, supporting resources were developed by volunteers from Tom Tony Bridge Baptist Church to cover child safeguarding in the context of child rights. Each workshop involved several hours looking at data that uh, 28 too many provided on FGM in Uganda, understanding the different ethnic groups that practice FGM, the physical and emotional effects on girls and women, and how to recognize girls who may have had FGM be before further health complication arise, as well as looking at how teachers should deal with FGM in their schools. How participants were also encouraged to identify how they could get involved in eradication of FGM within their communities. What did we achieve? The, in the initial impact was very strong. Many teachers had little or no knowledge on FGM. But after the training, they were full of ideas and determined to create a plan of action, including meeting with local faith leaders to share their new found knowledge and spread the word across the district. And in fact, uh, one month after that, we had a workshop of 400 uh, men and women from the community about it. An assessment by the trainer at the end of the program noted the passion of the teachers to protect the child within their school and also to educate the practice of FGM in Uganda. A few quotes from participants of that project can be noted. Now I will talk to the children about the dangers of FGM. I will ask my pastor to preach against FGM in church. Now I'm determined to report anyone involved in practice and I know where to go for help. One of the most important things I can do to prevent FGM at a as a teacher is to make sure children know their rights. They were the first to approach the topic of FGM from a biblical view and, pr and prove that in God's eyes, 
women are equal to men. As a teacher, we are going to be instruments of change to end FGM. Uh, what do we learn from that? The key learnings from this project for us has been engaging with and training teachers was an effective way to reach different stakeholder groups in the community. Girls at risk, parents, community leaders, and faith leaders, and using a child as an entry point into the community. Framing messages about FGM in a faith context, as well as human rights and health issues, was helpful to engage the Christian community. And we have a radio program called Voice of Women that speaks to 13 million people. Providing clear information relevant to the particular country and community issue, essential to get people to understand the issue and commit uh, to take action. And supporting of faith leaders at the school is influential in the wider community. And as we look ahead, this project demonstrates a simple, low-cost model which can be replicated in other districts, locations, and countries to increase awareness of FGM across the region and enhance skills on child safeguarding. We have almost uh, 40,000 schools. If we could do to all teachers, that would be great. Although this work was a collaboration to work with the, the Christian community, the principles can be equally applied for other faiths because in our school, we have 125 Muslim children and 750 Christians. The training can be further developed to look at early forced marriage and other key issues which can support girls completing their education and fulfilling their potential. And quality assurance training, Tony Bridge Baptist Church are supporters of the school in Vento and they are volunteers to learn their professional skills. And supporting materials, a workshop manual book was given to us which helped us and is, is still being worked on. And finally, follow up, the UK-based volunteer who delivered the FGM training remains in contact with World Shrine Ministries and will be returning to the school in 12 months after the original workshop. She will be able to assess the longer term impact and also identify further training and further support. So we are beginning a movement that will definitely and deliberately end FGM and early child marriages using education. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barungi. Um, I'd also like to let you know that he's with worldshine.org. Um, World some of you don't. Ministries. Pardon me, worldshineministries.org. We're going to move on, but please do hold on to your questions, especially mention there of actual practical skills on the ground. And if you would like to know about some of those, we can come back to that in the discussion. Um, we're going to turn now to Professor Gamal Saror. He sits in a very interesting position between the medical community and also in conversation with faith leaders. He's the director of the International Islamic Center for Population Studies and Research at Al Azhar University. He's also a professor of obstetrics and gynecology. I'm going to turn the conversation over to you now. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I will just start from uh, the comment of my neighbor about some uh, girls are. Uh, exposed to female genital mutilation because uh, they simply they have the basis that the religion uh, is has a basis in religion. I just want to say at the outset, uh, there is no religious basis whatsoever in Islam for whatever type of female genital mutilation, either type one, type two, type three. And I was lucky that I had the chance of working with faith-based organization since the year 1975 at Al-Azhar University, which is the most prestigious uh, Islamic source in the Muslim world. And uh, in this institute, when we produce to our religious leaders uh, the health consequences of female genital mutilation uh, on the reproductive and sexual health performance of the girls, and they came up with the recommendation that uh, it is against religious directions. And in fact, the, the Holy Quran does not refer explicitly or implicitly to any form of female genital mutilation. Uh, the, none of the Prophet's daughter was circumcised, and there is no authenticated hadith which support female genital mutilation. And we want to invest in these uh, religious resources which we have at Al-Azhar, and consequently, we got the leadership of Al-Azhar and the Al-Azhar University as well, and we issued various documents uh, which uh, uh, 
dispel misconception about Islam and harmful practices in general, not only female genital mutilation, like some of these documents, including the children in Islam, including the protection of children against violence. And also we, get in contact, we got in contact with the, uh, with the Catholic Church, with the Coptic Church of Alexandria, and we did collaboration uh, with uh, this, and we issued these uh, documents. Now, these documents became a background uh, for uh, the, those religious leaders who are involved, in, and we want to take it further step, and therefore, we conducted seminar and training program for the religious leaders from the remote areas, uh, from the governorate at the community level, where we enlightened them on the proper position of Islam on this fema female genital mutilation. And this was evaluated by a third party, and that proved marked improvement in the attitude and change of attitude of these religious leaders uh, when they are uh, talking about uh, harmful practices, including female genital mutilation. Furthermore, we took it further step forward, and we decided to train the trainers. We got a, so, some higher levels of the religious leaders in the different governorate, and we trained them uh, how they change their Friday uh, prayers address uh, to include uh, contemporary issues like female genital mutilation, which they did. Uh, and in fact, uh, they were very, very good, and they conducted themselves uh, courses for their peers. So the courses were, be were being given by the religious leaders and not uh, by us. And I m must say that this played a major role in the change of attitude and position of the society on female genital mutilation. And we provide this not only for Egypt, but also for the region and also for the Islamic world. We had scholars from different countries, from Africa, from Asia, and also from some of the European countries uh, where they are dealing with uh, community leaders. I must say, uh, this was not only restricted to this as well, but also we encouraged this top religious leader to issue statements and fatwas against female genital mutilation and harmful practices. And indeed, in the last case, uh, when there had been some setback on female genital mutilation in Egypt, uh, one of these documents was actually used with the prosecutor uh, in raising the case with the prosecutor. And this played a major role uh, in the change of the position and in the look into the case of female genital mutilation based on authenticated uh, uh, basis for female genital mutilation. And we always say that we have to look at the credibility of information because there are many preachers who claim that they know about the religion and the issues of fatwa. They are not really qualified for this. So when the information comes from a credible source like Al-Azhar or from the top religious leader like Sheikh Al-Azhar or the rector of Al-Azhar University, and these are the people whom we are working with, then it has a definite uh, 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 impact much more effective than those who claim that they are speaking for the uh, for the Islam, and uh, unfortunately in Egypt we used to have a high rate of uh, female genital mutilation, but now because of uh, all these efforts, because of the efforts of the National Population Council, the Ministry of Health, uh, the Al-Azhar, with the support of the religious leaders and the religious leadership at Al-Azhar, it has been declining. And unfortunately, the last DHS uh, is not published yet, but it will be published in uh, next month, actually. But it, the results, the information which we have today, it's so that there have been a decline from 91 uh, which was uh, in the year two, uh, in the last uh, DHS, uh, it is now declining uh, to almost uh, 75 uh, and even to 50 per, uh, percent among school girls, uh, and with the difference between the public school and the private schools. So I would like to say that uh, collaboration with religious leader is indeed extremely important uh, in our combat against female genital mutilation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Soror. We're going to turn to our final speaker now. Anne-Marie Wilson is the, exec is the chief executive of 28 Too Many, a charity addressing FGM. She's also a qualified psychologist and training consultant. She's going to make some summarizing remarks, and then we're going to open the floor for questions and comments. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here representing the government's interfaith engagement work and working parties. So let's just clarify what is the context of FGMC. As we all know, it's an ancient practice deeply ingrained in cultural context and a social norm. 
Although not a religious requirement, individuals often believe it is, and it's historically been practiced by Jewish populations in Ethiopia and currently practiced by Muslims and Christians in communities as wide as Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and the diaspora. So whilst not a social requirement, people often believe it is, especially women who are not literate. We need to stop hiding behind religion, tradition, and culture. And as one archbishop recently said at the Ending Sexual Violence Summit, we need to attain and keep the positive attributes while leaving the negative attributes that can be eliminated. Although most do not support FGM, it has been appropriated by some religious leaders, which creates confusion. With the Manor Gardens Faith Against FGM project in 2008, we showed it's not required by any holy book, Quran, Bible, or Torah, and those scripts are on YouTube, so it can be broadcast around the world. And this was recently affirmed at a ministerial briefing where we had 25 faith leaders represented. So what has been achieved? Across communities and countries such as, faith -based, such as Egypt, Malawi, Uganda, as we've heard today, faith-based communities continue to innovate, as we've already heard. In Tanzania, 28 Too Many worked with Tear Fund, and their work has led to 25 bishops and 75 community elders committing to a three-year change program towards abandonment. We've heard from Pastor Medad about the education role in Uganda, from my sister here from Malawi about the multi-actor approach of community and national leadership. We've heard about the UK work in Birmingham where schools and communities can engage and the critical role of engaging men and boys in public declaration and the role of potential fathers. And we've also heard in Egypt about how medical work can link with faith work, how leaders in a university can document the damage of a misunderstanding of Islam and harmful traditional practices and linking with Coptic Christians and use of Friday prayers. In a Somali refugee camp I worked at in Kenya, men became aware that FGMC was not practiced by everyone in the world, just like ending foot binding, and these parents chose not to cut their children and became advocates for change when returning to Sudan. These are in the pictures shown here when I worked in North and the South. And this is the power of communities in addressing leaders. So what lessons have we learned? As we've seen at the recent Ending Sexual Violence and Conflict Summit, faith leaders have influence in international, national, and local level, and can shape policy and offer direct interventions. This brings government and faith-based leaders together, like we're gathered in this room. Leaders can partner with local communities, and as 80% of Africans attend a faith building weekly, these provide great opportunities for teaching in prayer and worship, empowering girls and women and supporting girls' education, supporting survivors in their ongoing health needs, working with men and boys, community at work as activists and change agents, in education, sharing knowledge and sharing websites such as ours, and health. Most health messages I taught in Sudan were given in the sermon slot. Finally, displaying helplines as the NSPCC does in the UK and in Kenya can give people signposting, and a few people can make a difference as pioneers for others to follow. Organizations can make new commitments, as we have done and various others at the summit today. In terms of interfaith work and collaborative work with organizations such as We Will Speak Out and Restored, these bring people together and enable inclusive work to change attitudes and behaviors, as shown by members such as the World Council of Churches, Islamic Relief, the Church of England, and others all present in this room and at the summit. We're very excited that we've been collecting 350 pledges. Um, you've got a top 50 here, not really top 50 any more than a sample of what can be got on an A4 sheet, really. But I have been really excited that we gathered pledges from 10 bishops, um, the Evangelical Alliance, and you know what I thought was a small exercise, I think I sent it out to 10 people as a little taster, became a movement so out of my control I just gave it up, really. <laughs> and um, actually had the confidence to, to engage with Muslims reading their Quran on the, on the train, to gathering at a um, Ramadan breaking of the fast this week. Everyone I met has wanted to sign this. I've got more here, so you'll be glad to know you're not left out, really. And we can use this declaration to um, become a catalyst for action, just like the General f um, Summit pledge can be, to ensure faith leaders and faith teachers are informed about FGM and speak out against it using posters, materials, and health passport by the Home Office, to hold political and 
community leaders to account, ensuring we can tackle FGM, and also using opportunities like the General Synod or the Commission of Status of Women to share in an interfaith coalition. To facilitate local community dialogues and trainings like Pastor Medad's example to encourage abandonment and train teachers in faith schools, madrasas and Sunday schools on safeguarding. Wouldn't it be good if this energy and catalytic movement that's been started with this Girls' Summit can actually be harnessed for um, a change globally? I believe this Girls' Summit is the next step in change that is leading to the tipping point where FGM CMs. I've been doing this work for 10 years now. I used to think I wouldn't see it for 60 years, but I'm beginning to believe it will happen in my lifetime and God willing in my generation. Thank you. A very positive, optimistic note to end on there. I'd really like to encourage you now to talk with us. Um, what we're focusing on here is really how to engage people, how to collaborate. So if you have a question or you have something to share, please try to keep it um, focused on the practical ideas, things that might be helpful for others in the room. We have a few over here in the corner. Uh, you can just go ahead, yeah. Um, hello. Um, you mentioned that uh, work in Sudan. I myself come from North Sudan and um, recently uh, I've been communicating with people, my friends and some local charities so one of the stuff that I've mentioned, it was that um, I've made some in FGM, the broad research, and I found out that its origin actually come from ancient Egypt, ancient Nubian, Sudan it's itself. Microphone problem. Um, is everybody able to hear the rest of, of the question? Not really. Um, maybe we can even turn around one of our microphones. And do, Would you mind coming up here to state your question? I'm sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. as I was saying, um, the origins come from um, ancient Egypt and ancient Nubia in Sudan itself. So them two are probably the oldest two kingdoms in history, so it way before Islam, Christianity, Judaism. And from what I results that I got back, about 80% didn't know this fact, and it actually worked for them. And, p and don't you think that would be a good idea to take forward, to educate people that it was way before religion and before ancient times? So. Would any of our speakers like to comment on that follow up? I would like to compare actually what you said that it was there for two thousand years before Islam. So it has no Islamic rooting whatsoever. And indeed what is being quoted as in support of it uh, uh, these are unauthenticated hadith, and of course in the science of uh, uh, jurisprudence uh, Un, uh, with unauthenticated ideas. You go with the Quran first, and then if you don't find the verdict, then you go to the authenticated hadiths. The Quran, as I mentioned, it did not uh, refer any explicitly or implicitly to female genital mutilation. On the contrary, uh, it, it spoke a lot about humiliation of the human body, about uh, disfiguring uh, the creation of God, about inducing and inflicting harm, and forbidden all these. And if we all admit that all the data being provided by the credible uh, health organization, WHO, or the International Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecology, FIGO, saying that female genital mutilation is harmful, then of course we'll have to go by this information, and consequently there is strong support to condemn this practice. Thank you very much. We're also going to have a quick comment from Anne-Marie Wilson. Yeah, thank you for sharing. We've also been working in Sudan, and I work myself in the north and the south, and actually got into this because I met a little girl who'd had FGM in the conflict in Darfur, and I think that's another example. There's a paper we put on our website about how FGM is directly correlated with conflict and post-conflict issues. But I was also interested this week when I um, sat with the men breaking fast in my local um, synagogue, amazingly, for a, a Ramadan um, fast breaking, that the men knew about FGM. And I talked to the women and the girls, and these are girls in Britain and women, in, and they, none of them knew that FGM happened in the UK at all. And none of the girls knew about FGM at all, even though they're 12, 13 years old. So I was quite worried about that. And I think it gives us um, a, a desperate need for education, both nationally and internationally. So more needs to be done. We're going to move now to the next question. Um, we're going to have people come up. Is that how we're going to do it? If you could. Yes. Okay. 
Uh, is the microphone now working? Oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead. Look at it again. Fine. That's right. Well, hi, my name is Fawzi Avakar and I come from Pakistan. I actually had a s provincial commission on the status of women. My um, well, child early and forced marriages is an area that we really struggle with in Pakistan also. And our problems come when we're dealing with the interfaith leaders or the faith leaders, we're uh, our problems come not from the rational types that people are engaging with, but the irrational extremist militant types who somehow have grabbed hold of the society. And therefore, um, the government in various provinces, it's a provincial matter, uh, family laws, the governments in various provinces are, um, they are in favor of raising the age of marriage to curb early child, ma early child and forced marriages, but the threat from official uh, religious institutions as well as the unofficial, of course, religious groups is way too much for them, uh, even politically, to be able to deal with it. So my question would be how other countries with similar problems, and I believe there are others, uh, are dealing with it. And I'd also like to know from the professor from Al-Azhar University, um, if there has been a definitive fatwa from Al-Azhar University on child early and forced marriages, and also what kind of validity do you have or your, the fatwas from Al-Azhar University um, have with the extremist militant groups like the Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the question. Uh, the question which we have, uh, that's the validity of the fatwas which come from Al-Azhar. Al-Azhar is well known as the most prestigious uh, university in the Islamic world more than 1,000 years ago. And of course, it is being, uh, all the fatwas are being documented by the scientific evidence and scientific basis. Uh, it's not only just uh, based without uh, uh, scientific data being provided. And that's how I think uh, it gains its uh, credibility. Uh, and I fully agree with you, and this has been our problem, that you do get the extremists, even in Egypt, uh, and in the other uh, Muslim countries, you get the extremists who are saying different views, but uh, they are not uh, uh, qualified. Uh, they are not supported by evidence. They are misinterpreting the primary sources of Sharia, the Holy Quran, and the Hadith. Many times they go and uh, depend on uh, unauthenticated Hadith. And of course, there is a science of Hadith which tells you what is authenticated and what is not authenticated. It is important to do this. And we had this problem, and we overcame this problem by counter arguments and having a dialogue. And in fact, in this book, uh, there is uh, a dialogue between uh, the Muslim scholars, uh, one who is supporting female genital mutilation, saying his argument, and then the other one who is uh, defying uh, this argument and s uh, producing the evidence that what, is say, what he is saying or what she is saying is not true. And you have to do this, the uh, continuous dialogue, in order to enlighten uh, these uh, people. Having said so, you are bound, of course, to have some extremist, you know, which will never be uh, convinced. And one example of this is our fight in poliomyelitis vaccination. And uh, probably you know that there is an international advisory group uh, which is headed by Al-Azhar University and Islamic Fiqh Mecca, Islamic Fiqh Council of Mecca, uh, which actually fight against uh, the attack of uh, vaccination, the groups and the killing of the healthcare provider who provide vaccination based on the wrong fatwa from these extremists that vaccination is haram, vaccination is against religion, vaccination results in uh, uh, infertility, vaccination results in castration. So we have to produce the evidence for them and uh, then uh, base the religious basis on uh, these facts. We're going to move now to our next question. Okay. All right, fine. We do. Yeah. We have about 10 minutes left. I would also encourage you again to pick up some of these issues when the session ends. Um, just, just following on from what you said and from your question before, I mean, the idea that you know that you have these extremists and they are not credible, but the problem is is that they are gaining ground everywhere you look across the world. So even in Pakistan, I mean, the, the Pakistan Council of Ideology, for example, is arguing that the idea that having a minimum age of marriage is un-Islamic. Um, only this year in February um, in Iraq, we know that the foreign secretary there was arguing that um, you know they wanted to draft a bill reducing the age of marriage to nine, where currently it is stands at 18. And also, just, just more generally, I think there's a problem where I think as, as Muslims, as we need to acknowledge, 
that extremism is gaining ground and one of the first things extremists do when they come into power is to curtail women's rights. And it's not just an issue of dealing with um, forced marriages or dealing with FGM. In my work with the UK here is often that I find my frustration with faith leaders actually is that they might want to speak out about FGM but they don't want to address the root cause of all of these acts of violence against women and girls, which is gender inequality. And they, they, there's an unwillingness to talk about gender inequality, which is a fundamental problem that allows and perpetuates these acts of violence. And so until, I think, Muslim faith leaders start addressing um, medieval jurisprudence, which is, at the moment as it stands, um, promoting gender inequality, I don't think we're going to be very forward addressing in addressing these kind of key issues. Thank you very much for that. If anyone, um, we're going to turn now and ask you if you have some actual direct questions. Um, and I would also encourage you, if you have that, that was actually kind of a question in and of itself, how do we address that problem? If somebody has actual practical ideas about what we can do about that, that would be very, very helpful. I'd also welcome your questions next. Hi, um, I have a plea, a question and an offer, and I'll do it all in 30 seconds, I promise. Um, so my name's Rachel Crook, and I have the very great privilege of leading the UK government work with faith leaders on FGM and forced marriage. So I've worked with Anne-Marie and with lots of other colleagues who have very kindly joined us here today. Um, my plea is this, there is just me, and I use about a third of my time on FGM, and I have to do all the UK government faith engagement on FGM and forced marriage. Please help. Please tell me where you think it would be helpful that the UK puts its time and, and come to us and let us know how you want to work on things like the declaration that we've had incredible support with. The question is how do I identify the leaders to work with? I have a bunch of funding proposals sitting on my desk and I have to make decisions about who gets that money to run community engagement workshops. And I've got a spreadsheet and I've done my best, but you know what the best characteristics are when looking at those proposals. So what what would you look for and which leaders do I trust? Who do, how, how do I know who has credibility as you've described? And my offer, one second my offer, is we have a fund called the Together and Service Fund. This is a tangible offer. Um, it is um, run by Felicity putting a hand up. We fund interfaith work in the UK. The deadline is the 25th of August. It has to be in the UK, unfortunately. Um, but if you have any ideas about things that can tackle FGM and forced marriage, please apply. Can those that still want to ask questions just raise their hands again so I can see who you it's are? Nice and high. Okay, I'm, okay. I'm going to have to. We've, we've, let, we've I, actually I, been I think we should just let the answer come. There yeah. seems to be a lot of nodding in the panel. Um, do you want to answer that question? One of the things that I want to say that, um, <coughs> is that religion should not serve as a roadblock for any type of injustice. So, I mean, one mm -hmm. of the things that I want to say is that we need to understand here in the UK that we need to understand. We need to try and understand our religious texts and have kind of some kind of reformation in our interpretation. Um, the second thing is that no woman, I believe, should be forced to choose between safety and her religious community. That should be an automatic right. And she should be able to access the resources that the community has based on advocacy and faith-based support. So for me, um, is it is important that faith leaders can learn about violence and FGM. I think anybody, I mean, we don't have a hierarchy in Islam, but I do think that we need to go through some kind of mechanism to be able to find out who is a, an individual who is practicing faith and also has, you know, practicing justice as well towards all aspects of society, and that includes young children. Uh, again, that's safeguarding issues as well, especially in the UK, we have a lot of those issues. Um, as I believe that ill-formed religious leaders can present major road, roadblocks, and this is what we're experiencing, especially in the UK. Um, faith leaders, I believe, need to understand gender inequality. They really do need to understand that. And we have many faith leaders, and I think even at the sexual violence and conflict, as I, I was speaking as a faith leader, I had about nine faith leaders come up to me and say, you as a woman cannot go on that stage and speak about faith, okay? So that was just a massive roadblock that I had on getting on a platform as a religious leader, yet my background in terms of Sharia is I learned the Hanafi fiqh and the Shafi fiqh and all within like four, four years. So in many times I'm more qualified than to speak than them, but they will not allow me to sit on a platform to speak. And the other thing is a re no religious leader should undermine a woman's faith. Faith leaders can help from, a, from secular advocates who can provide safe spaces. Faith leaders need to utilize a position to inform and help shape discussions on issues concerning violence and gender-based violence. And faith leaders have to engage men, boys, 
as all as part of the solution. And I believe that with this kind of faith-inspired action, we, it's our sacred obligation as faith leaders to be able to allow for everybody to be on this platform and not just men. Thank you very much for that. Um, briefly, Professor Soro, you wanted to also answer that question, and yeah. then we'll move to a final question from yes, the floor. Thank you. Well, I just want to say that a religious leader, uh, to be effective, they cannot work on their own. And they, we have to work with them as well. We have to provide them with the information so that when in their discussion they are more convincing. Say, uh, when you talk about early marriage or child marriage, yes, there are some religious leaders who would say, no, there, there is no, nothing in the Quran or something like this. Uh, but when you produce to them that maternal mortality is 10 times higher in uh, childhood pregnancy, when you produce to them that fistula is much higher, that uh, rapture uterus, that uh, infection, uh, reproductive morbidity, and all these are much higher in these young girls, then they have more solid uh, uh, advice to provide uh, to others. So they cannot work on their own. And the other point is, uh, when we talk uh, to masses or to uh, unconvinced religious leaders, what our experience had taught us, we as a scientist, we talk to them about the scientific aspect of the issue, and then come an, uh, a, a reliable religious leader who would talk about religion and what religion says. And this gave us a lot of credibility, actually. When I go to a meeting, I always have with me, say, the dean of faculty of Sharia and law or the rector of Al-Azhar University, who is a sheikh. Uh, I don't speak about religion. I talk about mm -hmm. the medical aspect of the problem and the implication and the complication. And then he comes up. Uh, with the religious uh, uh, documentation and the, the proper uh, religious opinion. So I think, you. you know, it is, we have to be very careful when we are tackling these groups. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm so sorry, we're going to have to start drawing this to a close, but I would like to do a little experiment. Could you please raise your hand if you participate in interfaith dialogues on this issue? And just take a look around and see who your possible partners are in the room. If you people who are in the front, maybe look back. There are lots of hands in the air. Just take note of each other, because while we can't embrace the entire conversation here, please do approach each other in the hallways. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if we have time for the final question, because we've also got lots of com um, commentary that wants to come from here. So what I would encourage you to do, please hold on to your questions. And please ask each other. Please come and ask our panelists. Um, and Anne-Marie Wilson, also, Rebecca, you wanted yes, to make yes, a final yes. comment, um, just to also draw the conversation into the interfaith dialogue a little bit. Yes, yes. And uh, Rebecca, okay, please. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think I, what I wanted to say is actually it's also very important to look at how interfaith themselves can actually talk together, you know, because we talked about the, the difficulty of moving it from the whole fundamental extremism. Uh, but if you, like for instance, in Malawi, where we actually have got the multi-faith coming together, there's always that kind of thinking together around some of these issues and maybe moving them away, looking at them from a very much a, the harmfulness of what it does as opposed to actually the religious perspective of it. And we are finding some inroads in that because I've actually got even people from Muslim communities approaching me and working collaboratively with other faith communities to actually address this collectively. That's why I said earlier on, it's quite interesting that we should understand how interconnectedness of these issues, particularly at community level. And I think we can only really drive that change initially from that community level and drive it upwards. Thank Thank you. You. And, as our, and as our final comment, um, I, uh, Dr. Burungi, I'm not sure if you've had, uh, you, you haven't had a lot of chance to, to mention, um, but you did look like you were nodding. Did you want to make a final word? And then we'll have a last one from Anne-Marie. I was just saying that education, since all religious organizations, they were entrusted by God to educate children, you can never, never get all these practices out of the society without dealing with education. Mm -hmm. I want to challenge all of you who are here. If you want to end all these practices, education, education, education. Because ideas have consequences. So to, to erase these old ideas for 2,000 years, you must plant a new seed. And the new seed can begin at a very early age. And I'm sure within a period if education is taken as a serious factor in ending all these injustices and violences, these practices will come to an end. Thank you. That is my comment. 
Thank you so much. Good comment. I'm Marie Wilson. Yeah, I've produced a handout here, so it's got my email on it. So make sure you've got one before you go, and then you've got a contact for me. If you then want to still sign the pledge, we've got about 350 and rising. Please do, when you email me, say, I'd like to send the pledge, and I'll, I'll send it to you. We've got one on um, FGM and one on ending child and um, early child marriage. And finally, if you'd like to keep in touch, say that in your email as well, because I think this group here are the pioneers, the change agents, the activists. These are the people that activate and engage others in following. So if you're interested in keeping this, let's not waste this opportunity of sitting together. Email me and we'll gather together. And if those of you that are based in a geographic center, whether it's London or Abu Dhabi, Kenya, Nairobi, where, wherever it happens to be, we can gather. And I think this conversation could carry on. Perhaps there's an opportunity for some sort of interfaith forum, interfaith meeting, some shared space, open space, where we could actually take this further, where there's more opportunity for dialogue. So if that interests you, drop me a line and we can take the next steps together. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for your patience and for dealing with our shortage of time. I hope that that will be an interesting trigger for lots more conversation. And thank you so much to all of our panelists for working under the pressure of the time and also for all of your wonderful ideas. Thank you.